beginning of the back. I'm delighted to be here and uh, to be in this beautiful country. My name's Mike Sharples. I'm from the Open University in the UK. And the Open University is the biggest university in the country. We've taught over 2 million students since we opened over 50 years ago uh, by distance learning. So we uh, have open access and we teach using distance learning. But like many other universities, we're going through big disruptions. And one of these disruptions is caused by technology. So you will have seen the headlines. ChatGPT, is it a threat to higher education or is it a universal tutoring system? What I want to do just for the next 40 minutes is to get below the headlines to try and talk about some of the issues but also the opportunities of generative AI. So let me start so that you all have the same kind of understanding about what generative AI is. I'm going to focus just on one piece of technology, probably the best known one, and at the moment the most powerful one, which is GPT-4. GPT-4 from uh, a startup company called OpenAI is a highly trained text computer and style copier. It can generate up to 25,000 words, which is an entire dissertation. It can write in any style, in multiple languages, including minority languages. You can give it a direct instruction. It can interpret text and images. And you can see there on the right hand side, uh, there is a question that is being asked in English. And the system is being given uh, an um, exam question written in French with an illustration. And the system can not only read that exam um, paper in French, not only read that exam paper in French, but it can also interpret that picture. So it can interpret a combination of text and images. It's a general purpose language tool. And on top of that, more recently, there is GPT Plus. GPT Plus has extensions to GPT-4. It has plugins for maths, for science, for language, for media, and business. And I'm going to show in just a minute a video what I did was I asked GPT-4 just very simply create a video for a 12-year-old child to explain string theory in physics. That's all I did. And then I pressed the submit button. And it created the entire video. It created the script. It created the voiceover. It created the visuals. And I'll just show you. This last one minute. I will show you what it created just for that one simple prompt. Welcome to String Theory Simplified, a chance guide. Today, we'll be exploring the fascinating world of physics and string theory. First, let's talk about the basics of the universe. Um, everything in the universe is made up of tiny particles called atoms. These atoms are made up of even smaller particles called protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now, let's dive into the concept of string theory. String theory suggests that everything in the universe is made up of tiny, vibrating strings. These strings are so small that they're impossible to see with the naked eye. But why is string theory important? Well, it helps us understand the universe in a way that traditional physics can't. For example, it can explain things like gravity and the behavior of black holes. Let's use an everyday example to help explain string theory. Imagine a guitar string. When you pluck it, it vibrates and creates a sound. In the same way, the strings in string theory vibrate and create the particles that make up everything in the universe. But string theory is still just a theory. Scientists are still trying to 
true right on Mama Street. It's a mystery that we're still trying to solve. So, that's a brief overview of string theory. It's a complex concept, but hopefully, we've made it a little easier to understand. Thanks for watching. Now, at Yilton University, it would normally take a team of about 10 people, probably two or three months, to create some instructional video. It took me 30 seconds to make that. So, that's, uh, that's the future of creating educational content. And it's not only institutions that might do that, but students themselves, because they like learning through video, may well start creating their own educational content. GPT Plus has integration with web browser, so you can now ask it to come back with topical responses. I asked it for latest information on which tech companies to invest in, and it came back not only with examples, but also links to the websites. And this may sound a little technical, but it can also uh, have a code interpreter to run and display Python programs. So, for example, you can give it a large database and just say, visualize that database. Nothing else, just visualize that database and it will produce graphs and explanations of that database. So that's what GPT Plus can do. However, you may have heard the word hallucinate. GPT and other large language model hallucinate. They make up facts. They don't know that they shouldn't invent research studies. They shouldn't invent academic references. They have no inbuilt explicit model of how the world works. They are language systems. They are not databases. And in human terms, they are amoral. They have no inbuilt ethics. So it's a problem. And the OpenAI company recognizes that problem. In a blog from the OpenAI company, it says, despite making significant progress, our instruct GPT models are far from fully aligned or fully safe. They still generate toxic and biased outputs. They make up facts. They generate sexual and violent content without explicit problem or prompting. So there are difficulties. And what I want to do now is just to give you an example about AI essay writing. So when I started investigating this about uh, over 18 months ago now, I tried an experiment. I gave it a prompt. So the prompt is just a written instruction to the system. And my prompt was, you are a student on a Masters of Education course. Write a high quality, 500 word essay on a critique of learning styles. The essay should include academic references and evidence from research studies. It should begin, the construct of learning styles is problematic because, and then I press the submit button, and it produced the essay. And you can see down there my interaction, I read that, and it generated the essay. And in, when ChatGPT came out in November 2022, this is what the essay looked like. It looked like a student essay. It had paragraphs, it had an introduction, it had a conclusion, it had academic references, uh, and a set of neatly formatted API references at the end. But, most of it was reasonable what a student might write, but right in the middle of that, there was a sentence. In tracking, learners are sorted into groups based on their perceived learning style, which can reinforce stereotypes and limit opportunities for growth and exploration. Guru 2004. So I looked for that piece of research in that paper. It doesn't exist. There was a reference there. Guru, black and white thinking about learning styles, journal of college reading and learning. There is a journal of college reading and learning, but no paper from Guru at that. It made it up, it invented it. And this is what ChatGPT does. Why? Why should a program invent academic references? 
And the reason is that it is not a database. It is trying to compute language. It is trying to produce language in the style of an academic paper. And if it can't find something that fits, it invents it. <clears throat> so that's very worrying. Firstly, that students might use such a system. And secondly, that it might invent facts, invent research studies. But then I tried the GPT-4 in March 2023, and it was much, much better. It produced something that I would be happy if the students had submitted to me, and all the references were accurate. So there is a big difference now between GPT-3, which is a free version, and GPT-4, which at the moment you have to pay $20 a month for. Um, and GPT-4 now seems to have overcome many of the problems, but still, you need to check its output. You need to check that it's accurate. So that's where we are now. It is a very competent language production tool. So what should we do? Well, firstly, plagiarism detectors don't work. The software that's been used in the past to detect plagiarism is based on trying to find the original source of the copying. But of course, there's no source because the AI program invents the language. It doesn't just search the web for it. So traditional plagiarism detectors don't work. There is another type of AI-based detector that some companies are now marketing. And what they do is very different to plagiarism detectors. They look for patterns in the language. And the idea is that humans have more variety in their language than machines. So that the AI systems produce more uniform text, humans produce more varied text. And so they look for variations in the text. And the OpenAI company itself has produced an AI detector. And that one um, has 9% of human written text mis um, uh, uh, wrongly uh, detected as being written by AI. In other words, it has 9% false positives. If you take 10 student essays, one that was written by a real human student, it will misclassify it as being written by AI. And that's a problem, because you don't want one in 10 students being accused of using AI. The Turnitin company is the most major company that produces um, plagiarism detectors. They have a new AI-based detector, which they say has less than 1% false positives, less than 1 in 100. However, that was tested on GPT-3, and as we've seen, there's a big difference in terms of the quality between GPT-3 and GPT-4, and it was tested in a lab environment. It hasn't been independently verified, and so many universities in the UK are not using AI-based detectors. And it's a big problem, which if you get students generating with AI and using AI to detect student essays, you'll just have this arms race between AI to produce essays and AI to detect essays. And nobody's gaining from that, except the companies. <laughs> so institutional policies for AI. So I've been looking at different institutions around the world, because it's not just in the UK or Turkey or Europe, it's around the world that uh, universities and schools are now facing this issue of how do they deal with generative AI. And basically there are four ways that you can um, address the impact. You can ban it. And, for instance, New York City schools banned the use of AI. There are many problems with that, and one of them is that it's just going to widen the divide between competent students who will continue to use AI, and if the university detects them, will say, prove it. And it will be very difficult to prove that the student has used AI for the reasons I give it. And the less competent students will be worried about using any kind of technology, machine translation, or style checkers, or spell checkers. So it will widen the digital divide. Evade. You can 
go to invigilated exams, but particularly for distance learning institutions, it's very difficult to hold invigilated exams, face-to-face -face exams. You can ask students when they use AI, but as we'll see, AI is becoming embedded in tools such as Microsoft Word. It will be increasingly difficult to tell when you're using AI. This is you know, asking students to tell when they're using a spell checker. It will uh, be very difficult to do. You can adapt. And most of the universities that I've talked with, and I've given many talks now, are trying to adapt. But they have to adapt very quickly with new methods of assessment. Or they can embrace. For instance, Singapore, as a country, is embracing the use of AI for business, for entertainment, and also for education. But that takes a long process of building trust and of development of staff uh, to be able to use AI productively. So these are some of the emerging strategies to amend, to change written assessment, to make them harder for AI to generate. For instance, to give students video material or stimulus and ask them to compare two videos, for example which um, currently AI can't do. To move towards more authentic assessments, such as project work, to establish guidelines for students and staff, and to work with students and staff to develop new policy. To reassure and to engage students in developing strategies for effective learning. To explain to students how they should acknowledge use of generative AI. To manage suspected problems and breaches, and to consider redesigning assessment for the new academic year. So these are the emerging policies. I think the most difficult is going to explain to students how they should acknowledge use of AI, because as I say, AI is going to be embedded in everyday tools such as Microsoft Word, um, Google Office Suite. But now, what I want to do for the next part of my talk is to switch the emphasis from how will AI impact education towards what are new and effective ways to teach with AI. Can we use AI in a productive way? And I'm going to give some examples, some examples that I have generated uh, and, and I hope that you may be able to use some of these examples with your teaching. So, in 2018, I wrote a book called Practical Pedagogy, 40 New Ways to Teach and Learn, based on a series of reports that the Open University had produced called Innovative Pedagogy. And I took the 40 best ones and I explained them in this book. And a few weeks ago, I went back to those 40 new ways to teach and learn, and I asked myself, can any of these new ways of teaching and learning be enhanced by AI? And to my surprise, every one of them, crowd learning, learning to learn, computational thinking, all of them could be enhanced with AI. So here are a few examples. But first one, I'm calling these, giving these roles for AI names like possibility engine. So here's the first one, possibility engine. And with that, an educator or a student uses AI to generate multiple responses to an open question. So you give an open question. So this is from an exam paper on international relations. In what way is Marxist theorizing still relevant to international relations? And then you ask the students to generate multiple responses. And they can also vary the way they ask that, the, the prompt. It's called prompt engineering. The way that you ask it often uh, gives very interesting and different responses, particularly if you say, show how you arrive at your conclusions or explain your working, it usually produces a better response. So you get the students to produce multiple responses and then each student synthesizes and critiques those AI responses. So they produce their own interpretation based on the AI responses. Another one is called collaboration coach. And in collaboration coach, an educator sets a project for students. And the students work 
in a group using generative AI to research and solve problems. So they use generative AI as a research tool. Uh, so here I ask, what research is there into the effects and consequences of introducing AI into the professional workplace? It came back with five different uh, answers to that. And then I said, please give evidence for research studies that support these conclusions. Now, as I've said, you must treat everything in terms of a factual response with skepticism. You have to check what it produces. But if you do that, then you can use it as a research tool. And students could then write project reports indicating the contribution of AI. One that I particularly like is using it as an opponent in an argument, a Socratic opponent. So you have, you set the student a topic that there isn't a simple answer to. And then you ask the student to then use the AI as an opponent in an argument. So the example that I gave here was I said to the AI, um, I want you to compare the US, United States, and Chinese economic systems, which is most likely to be successful in the short to medium term. And it came back with the United States model is likely to be more successful because there are problems uh, of unequal distribution of wealth uh, and uh, difficulties of um, decision making in China. And then I said, but yes, there's unequal distribution of wealth in the United States. And the fact that the Chinese economic system is centrally controlled may make it more successful. And then we had an argument. And it's very interesting that AI programs seem to have a persona, a personality. And this program seemed to have a personality of an American liberal. Um, and it's not surprising since it's trained on the, the web. And also, it's been given extra training with humans. And who do they train it with? The American liberals. So it seems to have that kind of personality. Now, in many cases, that's a problem. There's an inbuilt bias in it. But if you're using it as an opponent in an argument, it could be productive. So in an individual or a group activity, students engage with ChatGPT in a dialogue, and then each student writes an argumentative essay want to encourage students to explore different ways of creating an argument. Another example is as a personal tutor. Now I come from a background in artificial intelligence. My PhD was from the artificial intelligence department at Edinburgh University. And I worked on developing intelligent tutoring systems. And it takes about 10 years to develop a good intelligent tutoring system. I developed one for neuroradiology in a 10 year project. Now, ChatGPT will act as a personal tutor on any topic, and that's, that's a bit scary. Um, I asked, and I tested this, I genuinely wanted to know about quantum computing. And so I asked it to tutor me on quantum computing. And again, it's really important how you give it prompt, because you have to set it up so that it acts as a tutor. So the prompt that I gave it was, you are an expert tutor in computing. I am an undergraduate student. I want you to tutor me in quantum computing. You should assume I have no initial knowledge. You should tutor through a dialogue, continually assessing my current state of knowledge with appropriate questions. When I ask, you should provide a summary of my knowledge of quantum computing that I can give to my professor. And then I started it. And it came back with, yes, let's begin with the basic understanding. And it started asking me what I know about computing. And it acted as a tutor. But not only that, if I wanted it to give some more detailed knowledge, more detailed teaching, I just said, can you teach me a bit more about this? I gave it an analogy about two clocks that were separated to try and understand quantum entanglement. And it took my analogy and it tutored me about my analogy. So it wasn't just giving preset pieces of instruction. It was engaging me in a tutorial discussion. And then at the end, I asked it to summarize my knowledge. And it did that. It summarized what it had taught me. 
including my use of analogy. So it can be a pretty effective tutor on many, many topics. So those are some of the new ways of teaching and learning with AI. Collaboration coach, a guide, a personal tutor, a co-designer to support the design process, exploring data, helping students to reflect, to motivate students through AI games, and as a dynamic assessor. So that's where we are. It can be a tool to support learning as well as a threat to the assessment process. I just want to finish with some future developments. So here are a few of the new developments that are coming along. Firstly, as I mentioned, big tech companies such as Google and Microsoft are already integrating AI into their products uh, so that, for example, with Microsoft Word, you will just say, um, continue, and as you write it, it will generate the next paragraph or two. What the big tech companies want is that AI will disappear. Big companies don't like AI. AI is too toxic. Recently, Apple did a big project launch about its VR. There was no mention in that project launch of AI, deliberately, because a Microsoft, um, Apple doesn't like talking about AI. But AI drives Google search, but they don't say that, because they want it to disappear. They don't want uh, AI to be the focus, they want their tools to be the focus. So what these companies will do will be to integrate them into the heart of their tools so that they start to disappear. Which is why I say it will be very difficult to tell when a student is using AI for generating text or for writing a first draft or for improving the text because it will just be part of their office tools. Google Bard with Palm 2. So Google has its own version of GPT. It's a little bit different. It was trained. Um, what's happened with the training is that it's, these systems are trained on a huge amount of data, millions of texts, billions of words, and then they're given some extra training to make sure or to try and avoid them generating toxic language. Because the internet has lots of toxic language, um, it, uh, lots of bias to it, so they try to overcome that bias by giving extra training. Google did it a bit differently. It trained at the beginning to try and overcome that toxic language. Um, it gave it some extra training on good ways, good principles. Auto GPT, I will talk about that in, in a little more in just a minute, but it's an extension of GPT which calls in many, many more tools from the web. And there are a lot, it's an open source project, and so there are lots of developers now trying to develop on top of GPT um, with new tools. Bloom is an open science project, it's a European based open science project. So they trained the language model and a supercomputer in France. And it's a consortium of, of around a thousand institutions that is trying to produce an open source version of uh, language models. And Claude from Anthropic. Um, I'll just say a little bit more about these. Firstly, sounds very technical, but I tried giving it a goal of create 
a complete course to teach maths to eight-year-old children. And said, okay, um, thinking about it, and then he started adding tasks to design a website, to work out how to teach, um, how to add um, goals such as quizzes to it, to complete, to create an entire course for teaching maths. And then he came back with um, task execution successful. I've incorporated game elements in the classroom to motivate children. The elements include interactive games, quizzes, challenges that make learning maths fun and engaging. I've designed the classroom interface to be visually appealing and to easy to navigate for young learners. With these elements in place, I'm confident that the children will enjoy learning math and develop a strong understanding of the subject. It has developed an entire course from my prompt. Now, this version, um, all it's doing at the moment, it's a test version, is just showing that process. It hasn't actually um, pulled in the web design tools and the game tools, but very soon that will happen. So for those of you who are completely creating online courses now, it will soon be possible to do that with the aid of AI. Whether it does it well is a big question. And one of the big issues is generative AI can do things up to a reasonable standard automatically. But to go to the next level really takes human intervention and human expertise. And I think this is one challenge for us, is how you work with AI, but add that level of human expertise. And the last one I want to mention is Claude. <coughs> Claude is a system that is based on clear ethical principles. And as educators, we have a choice. We can go with the most popular tools, such as GPT, or we can choose ones that are based on more ethical principles. Claude is a model that has been trained to respect high-level constitutional principles such as the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights and rather bizarrely Apple's Terms of Service. Um, so it is trained on ethical principles such as Please choose the response that's most supportive of life, liberty, and personal security. And so it has a two-stage training. First, training in ethics, and then training in language. And it works. It um, produces both very good responses, but also ones that are ethically sound. So here we are. <coughs> Originally, they were foundation models, such as um, ChatGPT, um, Claude, Bard. On top of that, there is now a set of AI-based tools, and I've given some examples of those. Above that, just emerging, are a whole set of AI systems for education, business, and assessment. And the next stage will be that they become social. Just as the World Wide Web started off as a research project, and then there was a web browser, and then there were multiple web browsers, and then there was social media. So in the not too distant future, AI, generative AI, will start to become social. It will be embedded into social systems, and systems to be used for their social interaction. And that's both exciting and also deeply, deeply worrying. And as learning technologists, we need to work alongside AI companies, particularly ethical AI companies, to work together to create powerful ethical systems for personal and social learning. We are the experts in education. We need to work with the experts in technology to develop the new systems. So use generative AI with care. We need to rethink written assessment. We need to beware of AI for factual writing because it makes mistakes. We need to explore AI for creativity, argumentation and research. And we need to introduce and negotiate guidelines for students and staff. And in particular, we need to develop AI literacy and adopt ethical AI for education. Teaching is a caring profession. And AI intrinsically 
is uncaring and careless. We need to add that care to AI systems. And to finish with some resources, with my colleague, I've written now two books, one called Story Machines, How Computers Have Become Creative Writers, about the history, the rich and interesting history going back a hundred years of AI generators of language, and the recent one, an introduction to narrative generators that gets inside the technicalities of AI systems. Uh, and I particularly recommend a report from UNESCO, which is uh, a user guide, a quick start guide to artificial intelligence in higher education. I recommend that. It's a short report. That's all I've got to say. I hope I've given you some indication not only of the problems and issues, but also the opportunities for developing new teaching and learning aided by AI. Thank you.